which means I'm not going to be able to do the 101 class. And, of course, it's kind of hard to be a part of a VCU 101 class uh, to meet the pastor and to figure things out about the church and all if the pastor's not there. So it would be kind of an empty class, I guess. Uh, so I'm having to move it. I want to apologize if that affects anybody's schedule. Um, I'll be making the phone calls and, and asking. And here's what I'm going to do. If you can't make it this Saturday, I'm not going to make you wait another three months for the next scheduled one. What I'm going to do is when I come back off sabbatical, uh, if there's anyone that was not able to do the, the 101 class, I will do another 101 class when I get back to make up for it. Because I know scheduling is a little difficult for people a lot of times. How many of you have never been through a 101 class yet? Okay, so many of you ought to have your name on that list out there. Uh, and that way you can get in. Gives you an opportunity to meet me. Talk. I'll talk to you about the history of our church, how we come about, how we transform things here uh, at night almost 24 years ago now, I guess it seems. And kind of overhauled how we do church. We do church very differently than a lot of churches, especially in this local area and all. Uh, we're kind of a strange duck. And if you come around and st stick around very long, you'll figure out, boy, they are strange people. We, But uh, we... Uh, it gives you a chance to, to study four lessons under me uh, as to what we believe uh, about salvation, about the security of the believer, about baptism, and about stewardship. What do we believe as a church? Where do we stand on? So, oh, excuse me. <coughs> Man, I must be allergic to church or something. I'm sorry about that. But it gives you an opportunity uh, to ask questions. Uh, it's a four-hour class. It's on a Saturday morning, starts at 8 o'clock, and we feed you breakfast. I've had people say, I think I'm just going to come back to the next one just because of the breakfast, you know, and, and do it again. But I get you out of here by noon, and it gives you the opportunity to look at us. Who are we? Who's VCU Church? Uh, what do we believe? What's a, the doctrine uh, of this church? How do, we, how do we study the Bible? All of those things. So if you've never been, maybe you've been attending for a while, but you've never been to one, Come. Let's sit down and let's, let's get to know each other. And, and uh, that way, when you're done, all you're investing is four hours on Saturday morning. When you're done, you'll know, is this where I want to be? Is this a church that I want to be a part of? So please plan on signing up if you've not done one. And we will see you this Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, okay? Be ready to eat breakfast and jump in and we're going to go. Um, obviously, summertime is still taking a toll on us as we look around at our attendance and stuff. Uh, but people are vacationing. I haven't done one yet. I'm going to. And so I'm not calling anybody out for not being here for vacation. But when springtime or when fall comes, school gets started again. We're going to fire back up as a church. We're going to get involved in our life groups. We're going to have our life group leaders back there ready to go. We've already got a study lined up. Uh, you'll be able to go to each of those tables and be able to look at locations, who's hosting, what times, of, uh, or what nights, what times, all of those. We do life groups from Monday night through Thursday night. So I want to encourage you to be thinking about that because come September, we're off and gone again. And we get really busy and we run hard all winter long, clear up to spring, and then we pull back and we take a break and we give our people, our, our team leaders and all, kind of a chance to catch their breath and, and recover and stuff, okay? All right, enough about that. The title of the message this morning is, That's the Story of My Life. Have you ever said that? Usually you're saying that because something else went wrong or something happened and you go, well, that's the story of my life. Anybody ever said that before? Anybody ever felt that way? Frank Sinatra, he made a song famous, My Way. How many of you have ever heard this song? Elvis Presley did it. A lot of other people did it and stuff. Do you know anything about the origin of that song, My Way, other than just you've heard it? There was a man by the name of Paul Inca. He was a Canadian singer-songwriter, and you'll know immediately who he is. Though you might not recognize his name, you'll recognize his work. He wrote the song, Put your head on my shoulder. Those of you that are older like me, um, you will know that. Um, he wrote the song Puppy Love. 
Anybody remember that song? You know, everybody over 50 is, man, oh yeah. He wrote the song, Having My Baby. Know that one? Remember that one? 1974. Um, <laughs> and he, security, come get him out of here. <laughs> um, he wrote the song, Diana. Yeah. I almost asked Taylor to play that song as my walk-in this morning, Diana. The reason why is because this Saturday, Diana and I will have been married 45 years. Yeah, you bet, yeah. And I'm going to tell you what, it is keeps getting gooder and gooder all the time. Now, that's a long time. Yeah, it tells you how old I am. Paul wasn't the original writer of this song, though, my way. He actually obtained the rights to it, and it was originally written in French, and, and the lyrics were a little bit different. And so when he obtained the rights to it, um, he intended to record it himself in English. But there was a dinner, a supper, that he was involved in with Frank Sinatra in Florida with two other mobsters, well-known mobsters at the time. And he's sitting there in the table with them. And Frank makes the statement, and I quote, I am fed up with the business, and I'm ready to get the hell out. Now, that was his statement. And Paul, right then and there, having acquired the rights to this song, thought, this song's not for me. This song needs to be for Frank. And so he rewrote some of the lyrics of the song, and he gave it to Frank to sing, which his own record label threw a fit about. But nevertheless, he, it was his song. He had rights to it, so he could do what he wanted to with it. And so he gave it to Frank to sing kind of as a tribute to, I'm stepping out of the business. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stepping away. So this was in 1969. Now, the reason that Paul wanted the song, though, because you're wondering... The world's he telling me all this stuff about? Well, I don't care. But the reason he wanted the song was because Paul was seeing something in regards to those who were coming of age in the 1950s and 60s, and he called them, I quote, the me generation. Now, what Paul didn't seem to realize or obviously didn't think it all the way through was every generation since the fall of mankind could have been called the me generation. But there was just something at that timeline or that time frame or era of time that he identified as, this is just a selfish generation. It's all about me. I want to ask you a question this morning as we get started. How many of you have ever found yourself frustrated with, or maybe even angry, with different seasons of your life. You've just been frustrated. You, you, you found yourself in a situation. Have you ever been tempted to blame God or um, to some way feel that he was responsible for your circumstances that you were in? And maybe not responsible for your circumstances, but it's like, where are you and why aren't you getting me out of these circumstances? Have you ever asked the question, why God? Maybe it was something that you were witnessing, or maybe it was something that was happening to you in your life at a specific season in your life. It could be anything, a breakup of a marriage, a loss of a loved one, something like that, uh, a job situation, and you just say, why God, why? Maybe you found yourself in difficult situations or circumstances that are solely your fault, your responsibility. Has anybody in this room ever made bad decisions? And then found yourself having to deal with the consequences of those bad decisions? Of course we have. Every one of us have. And how many of you, though, when you've, based on your own decision-making, your own bad choices, how many of you have gone to God and prayed and asked God to fix your problem? Anybody else ever prayed that? What if I was to tell you, because this message may not sit well with some of you, 
Well, what if I was to say that asking God to fix us isn't any different than blaming God for our problems, for our difficulties? I want you to lead your outline. First thing, right out of the gate, God has given us authority. He has given us authority over our life, which means that he has entrusted us to govern our own lives. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. Because we get in these messes, and we make bad choices, and then we go and we get on our face before God, and we repent, we say we're sorry, we, we feel remorse over what we've done, and we're definitely suffering the consequences of our bad choices and decisions. But then we go to God and we say, God, please fix this thing for me, God. God, heal my marriage. God, heal my situation, my finances, or, or, or whatever. We ask God to fix this stuff for us that we've got ourselves into. Now, a lot of things happen to us in life. It's true. A lot of things happen to us. It's not our fault. It's not because of our own doing. There are things that are going to happen to us in this life that are far beyond our control. But what I want us to consider this morning are the things that have happened in our lives that we've caused, situations we've put ourselves in, Bad decisions that maybe at the time necessarily didn't feel like they were bad decisions, but they turned out to be bad decisions because there are now consequences to those things. Now, when I talk about, when I say to you that God has given us authority over our own lives to govern our own lives, where's the, where's the premise for that? Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And we'll see it. Pick it up in Genesis 1, verse 26. God said, let us, speaking of the Trinitarian God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Representation and pattern. He said, let us create man in our image. And then look at what he says, let them rule. Let's give them authority over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. He said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And look at what he says. You subdue it and you rule. Authority. Over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Jumping into chapter 2 of Genesis, we pick it up in verse 15. And then the Lord God took the man. He put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and what? Keep it. I'm giving you authority. And the Lord God commanded man, and he said, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone, for I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky. And look at this. He brought them to the man to see what the man would call them. Whatever the man called them, a living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no, not found a helper suitable for him. When God created man, it was always his intention to, to impute to him authority to govern his own life. That is why the tree of knowledge of good and evil was in the garden. It wasn't a curse. It wasn't there to be a temptation. It was there to be an opportunity. God instilled in man authority. He gave him authority, and he said, now you govern. Now here's the rules of law. You can eat of all these trees. You can't eat of this one. But you govern. See, he put it all on man. Now we love that privilege. We love the idea that God gave us authority to govern our own lives, right? We love that. So much that we tend to abuse it. 
You see, as long as things are going well, we want to be the driver. We want to govern. We want to choose for ourselves. We love that. We relish the fact that God has given us authority over our lives. That is, until things don't go so well. And then when they don't go so well, because we've abused the authority to govern our lives well, it's like, okay, God, you got to get in and fix this mess. And God says, well, I didn't create it. I didn't do it. I didn't cause this. Adam did a great job. He was phenomenal at governing until he wasn't. And then when he found himself in a mess due to his lack of governing well, what was his reaction? The same as ours. Blame shift. What's her? It's the conditions that I grew up in. It's my mom and dad's fault. It's the environment, the, the, the lack of being able to have a good job. Uh, we blame shift. Go to your outline. Personal question. How do I address the circumstances in my life that I've created myself? Do you deflect blame towards others or circumstances? It's true. It is absolutely true. Some of you have been victimized. No doubt. You, you have suffered harm at the hands of someone else. No question. I'm not denying that. It was of no fault of yours, but you found yourself suffering harm at the hands of others. You didn't do anything about to cause that. You didn't, you didn't create the issue. But how you react and how you respond is paramount to the outcome of your circumstances. Now, maybe, and this is a hard one for people to swallow, maybe God is responsible for some of the things that we find ourselves struggling with and dealing with and difficulties in life. You know, David said in Psalm 119, 71, he said, I thank God for the affliction you brought into my life. Now, why, why would he and how could anyone pray that? David goes on in that verse of Scripture and he says, because it was the affliction you brought that caused me to learn your commandments, your statutes, your decrees. It caused me to draw close to you. It was the affliction you brought. The same can be true for us, depending on how we react or how we respond, that the affliction that someone else may bring to us can do the same thing. It can draw us into that relationship with the Lord that he desires for us. It, 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 the same is also true when we've made bad choices. We've made bad, situa bad uh, decisions that have got us into situations. Any and all circumstances are opportunities, guys, for us to turn the ship around, for us to govern well when we haven't governed well or someone else hasn't governed well. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus speaking here, look at what he says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Now, this is an amazing question. It's a powerful question for Christians to be thinking about because we want to govern our own lives. We want to do our own things until it doesn't work well for us. And then we want to go to him and say, Lord, Lord, you got to fix this, man. You got to take care of this. Help me, help me, help me. And Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not what I say. Everyone who comes to me hears my words and acts on them. I'll show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house. We're going to reference this here in just a little bit. 
He's like a man building a house who dug deep, laid a foundation on rock, and when the flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But the other one who has heard and not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on ground without any foundation, and the torrent burst against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the ruin of that house was great. Remember, the context of this message is about you and me making bad decisions, getting ourselves in messes, and then we want God to bail us out. We want God to fix it. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Why are you coming to me now when you've caused the issue? You've made a bad decision. You've made a bad choice. When we think about God giving us authority to govern our own lives, what does he mean then when he says, do what I say? Because if we have the authority to govern our own lives, why does it seem like the Lord is kind of removing that or taking that away from us, commanding us that we obey him? Well, if, if we have the authority to govern, yet he's commanding us to obey him, it seems like there's a conflict in regards to the authority over our own lives. I want you to look at your outline again, guys. The issue isn't that we have the authority to govern our own lives, but how will we govern our own lives? See, the privilege of authority lies in how we use our authority. Will we use it wisely, or will we abuse it? and then have to suffer the consequences of it. Back to your outline. The authority that God has given us lies in, the abil in our ability to choose how we will exercise that authority. And this is what makes the relationship with Jesus so impactful and so fulfilling. You see, it's difficult to have a fulfilling relationship with Jesus when all we're doing is whining to him about the messes we've created in our lives. Joshua spoke to this authority when he spoke to the people of Israel in Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in, in, in Egypt and serve the Lord. And look at what he says here in verse 15. He says, if it's disagreeable in your spirit to serve the Lord, then you choose for yourself. Again, authority and governing. You choose. You decide. You keep following these idols. You keep worshiping all these other gods. You keep chasing after them. But at the same time, you want to hang on to God. He said, today you got to choose. Today you got to make a decision. Am I going to follow the Lord Am I going to exercise my authority in governing my life and choose to follow him? Or am I going to continue to exercise my authority, abusing my authority, and am I going to do my own thing? He says, if it's disagreeable, then choose today who you're going to serve. Whether it be the gods that your father served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites and whose land that you're now living but listen to what Joshua says. He says, but I'm going to tell you guys something. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. See, Joshua had the same authority. He could choose what he wanted to do. He could choose to do his own thing and govern his life by, by following idols. Or he could say, no, I'm going to exercise my authority to do the right thing. I'm going to govern my life in a, in a manner in which will please God. The Bible is replete with scripture after scripture, putting this responsibility of governing our lives on us. There's a saying. If you give your heart to Jesus, if you pray a prayer and you invite Jesus into your heart, Jesus can change your life. There's no biblical support for that. Jesus said, repent and turn from your sin. Follow me, and I will bless the changes you make in your life. 
I will bless, I will open the floodgates of heaven in your life and honor you for choosing me. We have the authority to, to govern our own lives. What are we doing with the authority, though? In Leviticus, let me, let me just give you just a few verses of Scripture because I could spend the next hour or so throwing verse after verse after verse after verse where the Bible implicates you and I as having the authority over our own lives, to having the authority to govern our own lives. Leviticus 27 says, You consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. For I am the Lord your God. You keep my statutes and practice them. For I am the Lord who sanctifies you. 1 Peter 1, 14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former's lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves. Be ye holy. You have to do this. Also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy. For I am holy. We, we, we share the gospel with people. We share our faith with people. And people are broken in moments of vulnerability sometimes. And they give their heart to Jesus. And then they expect Jesus just to fix everything. And they expect Jesus to change their circumstances in their life. And Jesus says, huh? I never preached that. Jesus said, I'll honor you as you do the work. You see, the scripture tells us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The scripture says that he will not allow any temptation to overcome you by which he will not provide a way of escape, but you've got to take the way. You've got to take the path. You can't just sit there in a pool of tears wondering why your life ain't getting better when you ain't done no work, when you've done nothing. Jesus said, and I'll talk about this a little more, but I want to reference it right now. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross, and you've got to follow me. But so many in the church are thinking, well, God is just a God of grace, and he's just a God of love, and, and, and he's just going to take care of all of this for me. He's not. When the rich young ruler came to him, you remember that story, the rich young ruler, he said, what must I do to be saved? He said, go sell all your possessions. Why? Because he had an idol in his life. He had a God in his life. He says, you've got to get rid of that. When he called Gideon to go to lead Israel uh, in battle against their enemies and stuff, he said, you are going to have to kill a fatted calf. You're going to have to tear down your dad's altars and burn them. You're going to have to do this. Then, then when you do that and you build an altar to me, watch what I do. Are you starting to connect here a minute? Too many people are sitting around expecting God to fix them, expecting God to change them. God says, I can't, I can't change you. You have the authority to govern your own life. I, I'm not going to interfere with that. I'm not going to get in your business and, and interfere with that. You have the authority to govern your own life. If you keep digging a hole, that's on you. If you keep doing the same thing, that's on you. If you don't change your behavior, that's on you. And the Lord will not interfere with you. He will, not, he will not get in that. But if you repent of that, which means change your way you think, and you begin to pursue him, and you begin to obey him, exercising your authority to govern your own life, then God, like the prodigal son's father, We'll put the ring on your finger, put the sandals on your feet, put the, put the royal robe on you, and he'll kill the fatted calf, and you'll enjoy the life that God wanted you to have. But even in that story, the prodigal son had to what? Come to his senses and return. Because the scripture says he was far away. But when he came home, when he took the action, the father ran to meet him, didn't he? 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, John says this, everyone who has this hope fixed on him does what? Purifies himself just as he is pure. You know, in Colossians 3, it's one of my favorite New Testament passages of Scripture. You guys hear me say that stuff all the time. He said, well, you just said last week that that other was one of your favorite passages. This is one of my favorites. 
And in Colossians chapter 3, Paul says, you put aside the old self. He said, you rid yourself of the deeds of the flesh. And clothe yourself, you clothe yourself in the things of God. You know, last night my smart aleck daughter-in-law, Audra, sitting back there, she called me out. You know, I'm trying to get, I mean, I look great as it is, don't you think? You know, but I need to try to take a little weight off here. And so I've been working on some things, changing my diet around a little bit, trying to get, you know, a little bit healthier. And uh, man, we was at the races last night, and I'm sitting there going, man, I'd really like to have a Snickers bar right now. And she said, you know, one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. <laughs> and I thought, you shut your little mouth, you know. I'm the patriarch of the family. What are you saying? But I didn't. I looked there and I said, you're right. You got me there. You see, I had every right to go buy me a Snickers bar. But I have to exercise self-control. Now, the only other option would have been for Travis to have duct taped me in one of the chairs there in the race car trailer and said, you're not going to go get that. We see God won't do that to us. We want the Snickers bar. God will say, go ahead. You have the authority to do what you want. You have the authority to govern your own life. Or you also have the authority to tap into the source of our strength which is the Holy Spirit of God, and exercise restraint and self-control. No temptation will come upon you by what I will not provide a way of escape. But again, let me say, you've got to take the route. You've got to take the, the way. He will provide you a way, but he's not going to grab your hand and drag you through it. You have to exercise the authority that has been imputed to you by God. Many of the messes we're in are our own doing. And the Lord says, get out of it. As I was raising Travis and Gavin, there was times in their lives as they were growing up, which I refused to fix their problems. Oh, I could have. But it wasn't healthy for me to do that. It's not healthy for you, mamas. To always be doting over your children and fixing their messes and fixing their problems and picking up after them and cleaning up after them. You are setting them up for failure. There are times when God is, may assist us. He may do something. He may orchestrate and he does orchestrate the events around us, but he's providing us ways for us to do the right thing, for us to choose to believe if our faith is what it's supposed to be, to prove that our faith is real by the testing of our faith. Faith is not faith unless it's tested. He gives us the opportunity to put our money where our mouth is. And if we do, and we do correctly, and we react correctly, God says, okay, now, you just opened the door for me. You just gave me passageway to bless your life now. Because you're doing the work. In Luke 9, Jesus said this. He was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's on us. See, there were those in that parable that said, well, I want to follow you, but first I need to. And Jesus said, not worthy. Can't help you. I'm not going to make you. See, there are those in that story that were exercising the authority to govern their own lives, and Jesus was letting them do it. And what were they doing? They were cheating themselves. All throughout Scripture, guys, we see over and over and over and over again the call to exercise the authority over our lives. But do it in a manner in which God then can bless us and God can honor us. Now, let me say this again. God will not and cannot 
fix your messes. He won't. He doesn't work that way. But he does honor our work. He does honor our efforts. And he comes running to us when we are willing to do the work. All throughout, how many of you believe that God's love is unconditional? Because if you do, you haven't read your Bibles. God's love is conditional. Oh, I know. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But then here comes the condition that whosoever believes in him will not perish. But whoever believeth not will perish. Condition, I don't care how you've cut that, it's coming up that way. All through the Old Testament, God told Israel, you know what? You worship me and me alone. You serve me, you keep my commandments, you keep my decrees. You do all of those things and I'm going to bring rain on your crops I'm, I'm going to uh, increase your livestock, and I'm going to fight your enemies. But if you don't do these things, you're on your own. That theme, that thread is all through the Old Testament. It's why Israel kept getting themselves in trouble over and over and over and over. Now, I want you to think about what Paul refers to here, he talks about our bodies as being a house. Remember, uh, I, I used that, that term a while ago, a house. Paul uses that, that, that term, house, as well. He said, in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, he says, For we know that if this earthly tent, which is our house, using it as an illustration, that our bodies are a house. If it's torn down, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heavens. Now, I want you to notice what he urges us to do, though, with our house, with our bodies. In Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, he says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice on you. You're building a house. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And then he gives further instruction, and he says, in the building of your house, do not conform to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Repent. Repent does not mean remorse. It doesn't mean you feel bad and you're sorry for what you've done. Repent means you change the way you think. You change how you think about something. Some people's moment of repentance is very emotional. And some people's moment of repentance is like, I'm done doing that. I'm doing this now. I'm changing how I think about this. I'm going to follow Jesus. And it doesn't have an ounce of emotion in it at all. But it's a choice. It's a decision. Now, we are to build our own houses. Now, some of you Bible students are going to say, oh, wait a minute, preacher. What are you going to do with Psalm 127, verse 1? You ain't trapping me. Unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. Okay, so if God has given us the authority to build our own house any way we choose, what does it mean that the Lord is building the house? Okay, now you said I have the authority to build my own house, but then David said that, but the Lord has to build it. How many of you have ever built a house? I built three. How many of you ever built a house? Maybe you're building a house right now. How many of you want to build a house? Let me advise you not to. <laughs> but when you build a house, do you manufacture the materials for that house? Nope. You got to go purchase those materials from someone else. Look at your outline, guys. In the purchasing process of building a house, you have to decide, number one, what materials that you will use. Number two, how much are you willing to pay for those materials? And you do so depending on what? The quality of those materials. Now, a lot of contractors over the years have built up housing sub subdivisions and stuff. And a lot of times when a contractor is building up a housing division, he's looking for the cheapest material he can get because he wants to keep the cost down so he can make a lot more money on the back end of it or on the sale on the house. But the problem with that is the result of the house 
over the long haul may work really good in the beginning, but as time goes on, it starts costing the homeowner more money because it wasn't built with good quality material and it's not efficient. And so energy costs are out of control. It's got cheap windows in it, all kinds of things. And all at once now, you're spending a lot of money on the back end for something that wasn't used or didn't use good materials on the front end. The same is true in regards to how we build this house. We're the builders. We're the ones that, that, that have, to be, have to exercise the authority to govern our own lives. But we have two options in building our house. Do we get our material from God, from the Word of God, from Scripture, which will help us to avoid many pitfalls in life as we go through life, or we can get our materials from the world? We have the authority to decide. Where are we going to get our materials from to build the house? Now, here's the deal. Both sources are going to cost us. Whether we get them from God or whether we get them from the world, the materials are going to cost us. Getting our material from the Lord, let me just tell you right up front, is going to be more costly. Getting your material from the Lord is going to be more costly on the front end. How do I know that? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow him. What does that mean? Surrender, sacrifice, and work. Surrender, sacrifice, and work. It's more costly on the front end. When we repent and when we turn our lives over to the Lord and we begin to purchase materials or get materials from the Lord, it's costly. The Bible very clearly says that anyone who desires to live godly will suffer, will be persecuted. Or we can get our material from the world. Now, the thing is, getting our material from the Lord, although we have to pay more up front, the cost feels heavier up front. In the long end, it pays dividends. When we go to the world, which many do, even Christians, and we get our material from the world, guess what? That material is cheaper on the front end, and there's more choices. There's more options. But the material is not as good, and it will not last. It's always temporary. And so, but we got so many more options out there. But in the end, you pay a much higher price for the cheaper material. Where do you get your material from the Lord? As we wind this thing down, I want you to think about how am I building my house? Where am I getting my material from? Am I getting my material from the world? Doctors, psychiatrists, medicines, internet, uh, my phone, Facebook, friends. Maybe they mean well. Family members, maybe they mean well. Am I getting my material from my job? Am I getting my material from, from everything that I can touch that's tangible? Or am I getting my material from the Lord? Am I going into his word and saying, Lord, I want to build my house, but I want to build it with your stuff. I want to... I want to I want to know the realization of the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I want to exercise patience. I, I want to exercise love. I want to exercise kindness. I want to exercise self-control. I want, I want all of those things that, that I can get from you. I want you to consider this word authority as we start winding this thing down. Do you know it's the same? It comes from the same root word that we get the word author from. We all know what an author is. An author is one that writes a book. And when he writes that book, he owns the rights to that book. Look at your outline. Just, just look at it for just a minute. God's given you and I the rights to write our own story, guys. He says, I'm giving you authority to rule. I'm giving you authority to subdue. I'm giving you authority. How are you going to use that authority? You going to abuse it? I'm going to ask you two questions. How have you written your story so far? 
You wish, how many of you wish you could rewrite some chapters? Man, I do. I wish I could go back and rewrite some chapters of my life. You know, and Satan would love nothing better and to make us feel guilty about how we've written certain chapters of our life. He'd love us to just keep going back and rereading those chapters and rereading those chapters. Feeling the guilt and the shame and, and all of the, the bondage that goes along with those chapters of our lives. The reality is, guys, and none of us, None of us can go back and rewrite chapters. They're already published, guys. And we can't go back and rewrite them. I don't want you to listen to me very, very carefully. Not all the chapters of your life have been written yet. And just because the earlier chapters of your life cannot be rewritten... They don't have to influence the remaining chapters. Amen? They don't have to influence the remaining chapters. How are you going to finish your story? How are you going to write the final chapters to your story? The Lord says, that's up to you. He says, I I won't interfere with that. You have authority to govern your own life. You have the authority to write your own story. But if you write me out of it, there's nothing I can do for you. There's nothing I can do for you. But if you write me into it, I'll run and meet you. I'll put a ring on your finger. I'll put sandals on your feet. I'll put a robe on you. And I'll kill the fatted calf for you. And we'll celebrate together. You know, doing that doesn't mean that you necessarily will avoid conflict and issues in the future going forward. There's going to be rough patches in those chapters. No question, no doubt. But you know, as you keep just writing the Lord into those chapters, he just keeps showing up. And he just keeps giving you more material. Come on, build with this one. Put put this one out there. Let's use this. Let's use this right now. Here, here it is. Here, here. Do something with this. God, that's what he does. When we are writing him in to the chapters of our story. When you finish your story. When you've written the story of your life and your life comes to an end. Let me ask you this question. What endorsement will the Lord Jesus write into your story? What will be his endorsement in the four front pages of the story of your life? I pray it'll be this. In Luke, or Matthew 25, 23, it's your takeaway, guys. His Lord said to him, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. As you've been faithful over a few things, Ralph Morris, you wrote me in to the the late chapters, the final chapters of your story. So my endorsement is well done. Well done, son. My good and faithful servant, I'll make you ruler over many things. Is that the endorsement he's going to write into your book of your life. It's up to you. You're the author of your story. You're the builder of your house. Don't build without him. 
and don't write the rest of the chapters of your life unless you write him into them. Jesus said, I've come that you have life and that you have it abundantly. Bow your heads and pray with me, please. Father God, I pray this morning that in no way have I misspoke or that I have muddied the waters in any way. Father God, you, you have entrusted to us our own lives. And you've said you've got the, the authority to do with them what you want. But if you use that authority well and you surrender that life to me, you have promised us eternal life. You've promised to love us, to protect us, to provide for us, to give us the strength to overcome the battles of our lives, to provide us the material to build our house as well. Father, I pray for everyone that is in this room right now or is listening to us online that right now will be the day of salvation. Right now would be the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. Father, I give back to you authority over my life. And I pray that everyone listening will do the same thing. That they will come under your authority. They will submit to you as I desire to submit to, submit to you. You are Lord of my life, not me. And that's what I pray for all who are listening. Father, if today be the day of salvation for anyone in this room or anyone listening online, I pray right now that they would begin to repent of the sin in their life, change how they think about it, and turn from it. And they would begin to walk with you, trusting you to provide the material, to provide the strength, to provide the resource, to build a life well lived. So that in the end, we enter in to your joy. We enter in to eternal life forever and ever with you. I pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. This morning, if you have prayed, 